Huh. Watching Kyle's unboxing videos again? Yeah, he always finds the coolest... No way! A robot dog? Gotta ask where he got it. Or use your Samsung Galaxy S24 Ultra. Just draw a circle around the dog on your screen, and it shows you where to buy it right in the app. Oh, I just learned a new trick. And that for once, I beat Kyle to the next big thing. Circle it, find it, with the new Galaxy S24 Ultra, and circle the search with Google. Get yours now at Samsung.com. Internet connection required. Results may vary based on visuals. And we're going to talk about brain trauma and how that can lead to death, which it did in Bob Saget's situation. There are five different structures that can get damaged from an external blow to the head. But it's just this, this debilitating social inability to hold anything still, whether it's writing or drinking from a cup. This is just so exciting. I don't know how you even sleep at night. <laughs> Welcome to Fill in the Blanks, and you notice we are back in studio for the first time since, gosh, almost two years with a live guest in front of us, and it is my dear friend, Dr. Bradley Jabor. Now, if you've been watching Dr. Phil for years, you've seen Dr. Jabor on the show. He honors us with his presence and wisdom. Whenever we call on him, actually, he apparently doesn't have no in his vocabulary. When we call on you, you always say, yes, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to be here with you, Phil. Well, you do such a great job for our viewers, and they light up the message boards every time you're on. They have so much interest in the things that you do. And just to take a minute, Dr. Jabor is an internationally recognized neuroradiologist. He's got more than 30 years' experience in academic and clinical practice, having authored dozens of peer-reviewed research articles as well as textbook chapters. He served his radiological residency at Stanford University and the University of Southern California as well. He's a senior member of the American Society of Neuroradiology, having performed fellowship in neuroradiology at USC and Interventional Radiology and Head and Neck Fellowship at UCLA. You just covered them all, right? Yeah. I mean, all Stanford, Cali- USC, <laughs> yeah, UCLA. Yeah. Is there anywhere you haven't been? He was appointed to the radiology faculty at UCLA, where he was attending professor in head and neck radiology and was chief of neuroradiology at the VA UCLA Medical Center. Until as recently as 2013, he was attending radiologist at UCLA Head and Neck Grand Rounds, and he received the prestigious Certificate of Merit Award from the Radiological Society of North America in 1991 for his research in defining the role of PET scanning in detecting cancer in the extracranial head and neck. He's gained national recognition for developing new techniques in cancer imaging in the head and neck using PET scan and CT. And I've really been fascinated by your recent interest in the field of the functional MRI, the fMRI. Tell us, so people understand, what fMRI is and its role in evaluating neurological disorders. So functional magnetic resonance imaging is a way to look at the thinking brain. You can, instead of looking just at the architectural structure of a building, let's say, the brain, think of a brain as a, as a 3D structure. And when you're looking at a plan of a building, you're just seeing draw lines. You're not getting any information about how the air conditioning's working or the electronic system or what sort of sound system. With a functional MR, we're able to interrogate the brain's deep functions and see the connectivity between different areas of the brain and the abnormal connectivity, which, which we see a certain pattern, whether it's an Alzheimer's disease or whether it's a neuropsychiatric disorder such as depression. Yeah. And I don't want anybody glazing over and saying, oh my God, these guys are going to talk about a bunch of abstract stuff. No, we're not. We're going to talk about things that matter in your life all the way down to your children's lives and the way their brains function. This is going to matter if you've got kids that are playing soccer, you've got kids that are playing football, 
if you're having any questions about the way your brain is functioning or aging, whatever, we're going to talk about these things in ways you understand and talk about things that you can do about it. Because this fMRI, the way your brain is actually functioning, he's focused on brain degeneration, traumatic brain injury. And of particular interest to me is the neuropsychiatric brain disorders, because so many people think that a lot of these neuropsychiatric disorders are purely psychological, and they're not purely psychological. So many of them have neurological underpinnings that if you don't deal with that, you'll never get back to real functioning. And there's been some great strides made, and we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. But as a member of the American Medical Association Radiological Society, you've really contributed so much to the working knowledge of the brain and what it really means. And sadly, we've had some real focus on traumatic brain injury recently, losing a real beloved individual in Hollywood, Bob Saget. There's been a lot of talk about what caused his head injury and death. I'm not going to speculate about what caused it. I did not know Bob Saget well. I just met him. But his family has really asked for privacy and people not to speculate about how that may have happened. I'm going to honor that and not talk about it. What we do know is that he had a brain trauma. And we're going to talk about brain trauma and how that can lead to death, which it did in Bob Saget's situation. I'm not going to speculate about how that trauma may have happened. That's up to them, and they won't discuss that. They will. So I'm not going to ask you to speculate or intrude on that. I'm just going to talk about what happens when you do have that kind of brain trauma, however it may occur. If you have some kind of head trauma, some kind of intracranial hematoma, what are we talking about? So what we're really talking about is a kinetic energy applied to the cranium. And when you think of a, a lump of jelly, and around the jelly is this very, very rigid and uh, durable structure, which is the skull. And if you had to just shake, shake it, you're going to damage that jelly. But in the brain, there are, a number, there are five different structures that can get damaged from an external blow to the head or external force to the head, whether it's rotational or direct smack on the head with acceleration, deceleration. We could go through those, me those mechanisms and how those structures impact the brain. Okay, now when you say acceleration, deceleration, this can happen in a car accident, right? Yes. Where somebody rapidly decelerates and so their head is snapped forward and back. So maybe the head doesn't actually hit anything, but it snaps forward and back really fast. Now, usually one part of the head will hit something. So that you, usually you'll, you'll, um, you'll have either the back or the front hitting something solid and immovable. Either. Even if it's the back headrest or? Yeah, it could even be the headrest. Um, and that would be the, the primary the coup injury and the contra coup is when the head snaps in the contra in the opposite direction and the brain doesn't move as fast as the skull and therefore the brain smacks into the skull in the opposite region so you have the direct area of direct trauma and then the other area where you don't have a fracture so you'll have a fracture where there's a possibly where or a bruise over the area of the brain that got the direct trauma and then only an internal injury on the contra coup side. Okay, now people in the lay world talk about talk and die. Natasha Richardson, Liam Neeson's wife, was skiing a number of years ago. The truth is you might develop signs and symptoms of an intracranial hematoma right after an injury to your head or they may take weeks or longer to appear because there could be a slow bleed that is building up pressure inside the brain cavity, correct? That's right. And in fact, two of those structures, I remember I said there are five structures inside the brain that can kill you. 
if there's an injury. So in the case of somebody like Natasha Richardson, where she had, a, I think it was a linear fracture, but didn't get it treated that night. But the pressure develops over hours. So the patient can get an initial injury, think they're okay, and then when they go to sleep that night, they could actually not wake up because the, the blood has accumulated and, and caused a herniation or a, a pressure such that the brain herniates under the membranes that are rigid and switches off uh, the brain function. So with the passage of time, if there's a bleed, they might start experiencing increasing headaches, vomiting. There could be drowsiness or progressive loss of consciousness. They could get dizzy or start getting confused but not realize yeah. that they're confused because they don't have the objectivity to know it. That's why it's good to have somebody watch you that is objective because you might have unequal pupil size, you might have slurred speech, and if somebody's watching you, they can check your eyes and go, wow, one of your pupils is much larger than the other. You're starting to slur your speech and you're not making a lot of sense. You know, it's quite dangerous when you get uh, a significant blow to the head. You might not be unconscious, just slight loss of, of um, orientation and not realize that you've actually developed a tear in the, in the artery in the epidural space, and then um, that goes on to cause a catastrophic bleed, even though the patient feels they're not super sick. They may be a bit nauseous. They may, as you said, be a little disoriented. So those are the signs not to ignore if you get a blow to your head because it's totally treatable. Yeah. With a CT scan, in you have to get a, an immediate CT scan, neurological examination, and if there's blood in that extradural compartments between the cranium and the brain, it's a very easy to detect thing on a non-contrast head CT scan. Yeah, there's not a lot of space in there. No space. Well, the brain, the brain is forgiving to some extent, but because the the cranium is not forgiving, if you build up any swelling from one of three things, either when you when the brain is um, get, it receives a blow, it can swell. That swelling itself puts pressure in other parts. Or if a vessel is broken and you bleed, you're now increasing the, the volume of tissue that doesn't allow the brain to function because it's now putting pressure on other areas. So anything that causes a swelling of the brain or increased hemorrhage into the brain can lead to that catastrophic event with herniation and death. I'm Katie Maloney, 37, a divorcee, and I'm out here falling in love every day with myself. And I'm Dana Kathan, 33, former needy mess and delusional Leo, but I've never been happier. Never been happier. You know that. Good. <laughs> the foundation of this podcast is for people who want to live their life unapologetically. It's a safe space for anyone who's going through a transition in their life or just dealing with the regular bullshit. It's a religion. We're not saying that we're looking to start a coven, but that might be why we started but this we're podcast. Not, not Stop saying that. Join our cult. I mean, community. I mean, the coven. Religion. Okay, let's just stick with community. Listen to the podcast. Listen to the podcast. <laughs> I dealt with a lot of closed head injuries back in the days when I was practicing, and I would often see some degree or even total paralysis on the opposite side of the body from where the head injury had taken place. Yeah, when you get that, that's goes to, you go to the hospital. Those people aren't going to go home and um, and develop a a little bleed and and then become a big bleed. When you have neurological signs, you know, we use the Glasgow Coma Score as well as all sorts of neurological testing. And those types of people will definitely get a, a CT scan. It's the dangerous one is the person who has a head injury, gets up, says, oh, that wasn't so bad. M especially older guys who may be on aspirin and they and they um, have been anticoagulated, the, the Little vessels, you either get slow leak if it's a vein that's that's torn and you get a subdural hematoma, which is a low pressure but nevertheless just as deadly, or if you have an actual fracture of the of the skull and you tear the artery, you get a high pressure pouring of blood into the epidural space, which is what Natasha Richardson had. 
So you have a much slower bleed if it's a vein and a much faster, high-pressure bleed if it's an artery. And the problem is sometimes if this happens to somebody that's alone, maybe they're out in the woods hunting or they're at home alone painting, they fall off a ladder, and nobody's there to say, hey, you're not functioning properly, that's where you're really dangerous if you don't have somebody there to look on and give you some feedback that you wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah. You know, the different types of compartments where the blood can be is outside the brain, where it puts pressure on it, epidural and subdural, or when they say brain bleed, intraparenchymal in the brain tissue itself, Mm -hmm. where there's actual hematoma in the brain substance that causes an immediate neurological finding. Yeah, because you can have acute, subacute, and chronic, and these are going to show up differently. But all of them, you need to pay attention to them. And the risk of a subdural hematoma, you know, this clearly increases as you age. And it's also greater for people that are taking some type of medication that thins the blood, even aspirin, yeah. or they ingest a lot of alcohol. Those are two things. If you're increased in age and you're taking some kind of medication that thins your blood or you drink a lot, you are particularly at risk if you have some kind of blow to your head. That's true. Yeah. And so I want people to just be aware of that. Talk about an epidural hematoma. So an epidural hematoma is a, when there's a tear in the artery, which is a high pressure system, it's usually the middle meningeal artery that runs just inside the cranium between the cranium and the dura, which is a tough membrane that surrounds the brain. And if you tear that artery, you get a classic elliptiform accumulation of blood that puts pressure sort of, um, maybe I can draw a picture. Um, The vessel runs inside and here's the brain. And if you tear this vessel, blood accumulates, I'll do it in another color, Blood accumulates in an elliptiform shape like this and will tend to increase and start pushing on the brain. And um, if it grows, that blood just continues to push down and then you put pressure on the brain stem down below and you herniate through these membranes. These membranes are rigid and if the brain kind of squeezes like jelly under one of them, it just tears and and also puts pressure on the on the vital centers, the respiratory and the cardiac center. Yeah, and we're showing that image to people that are watching this, but for those that are driving right now or walking, yeah. what you're saying is there's a really tough lining that protects the brain and that if you get a bleed that pushes down on that lining, it pushes down on the brain. Or shifts and, it left to right. It could yeah. sh- it shifts either pushes it down or or side to side. Yeah. Either it creates way pressure. Pressure on other areas that shouldn't have pressure on them. Yeah. And the same with the subdural. It's just that they have a different dynamic. A subdural is a slow, low pressure bleed. Mm-hmm. So those are the ones that you find you get a blow, you can talk and walk and you think you're okay, and then it just leaks away and then uh, and then the person doesn't wake up the next day. Yeah. These can happen from, you know, a significant blow to the head. But a lot of the sports, for example, children's soccer, they've started saying these kids shouldn't be doing headers in soccer. They shouldn't be hitting the ball with their head. It's no big trauma, perhaps with one time, but if they do it 70, 80, 100 times throughout a season, that that can accumulate to create a problem. Is that a problem cumulatively insulting the brain time and again and again and again and again with banging a soccer ball into their heads? So we now know the answer is yes. The short answer is yes. Um, But to be more specific, it's the inability of the neck muscles. We know that women's soccer and children um, have more Um, risk for the acceleration deceleration injury really it's not that the ball is hitting your neck it's that when you head the ball as the ball hits 
the brain moves one way and then another, and that accumulatively, and there's been a lot of studies now both in soccer and in, in football schools and colleges that um, with advanced imaging techniques, we can see the changes pre-season when we measure things called fractional anisotropy in the brain that even without hemorrhage, it's just the accumulation of mechanical trauma can damage the brain. It's very controversial in terms of the sports, and one doesn't want to stop people playing sports. Of course not. But it's a matter of of putting this into the right context, and not. I, I, I'm a little disinclined to get everybody too anxious about it, but the, they should pay attention to it. The, heavy, the weight of the ball with respect to the strength of the neck muscles of the person. So smaller balls in young kids, lighter balls for women. Um, they did a study on, on British football players and the guys who play in defense often are heading the balls that come from a long distance and many of those have had more brain degenerative disease that they followed into their 60s and 70s than, than the guys who are the forwards who don't head the very big kicks from um, defensive positions. Well, you know, CTE is chronic traumatic encephalopathy, and that's a term used to describe brain degeneration likely caused by repeated head trauma, but it's a diagnosis that's only made at autopsy by studying sections of the brain. It's a rare disorder, and we don't know how rare. It's not really well understood yet, but this is something that we're learning more and more about at this point, and we do need to think about this. Mm-hmm. We need to yeah. be aware of it. You and I both spend a lot of time playing sports, and we've had a lot of brain insult along the way. I don't know what the impact is yet, but parents do need to think about that. Yeah, That's why helmets are important on bicycles and mm-hmm. everything you can do to protect the brain. Yeah. Also, the mechanism of tackling um, how you tackle in in football versus rugby, there seems to be a slight difference in the way um, rugby players tackle. And they, they although they do get head injuries, and there isn't the same long term. The statistics haven't been completely worked out, but I think they believe that the mechanism of on the technique of tackling, where they're not leading with the head. Um, in the uh, in rugby versus f- American football, so there's some thought that should go into studying the biomechanics of those two sports with respect to head injuries. Yeah, and that's why they have all of this targeting now in American football. You know, helmet to helmet. You do that, you're out of the game at this point. They're doing everything they can to eliminate that from the sport so they don't have serious head injuries. Also, targeting anything above the shoulders, attacking um, and and doing a above-shoulder um, tackle. I think those things, are th- I'm not an American football expert, but and I should be staying in my own lane, but I think there's more tackling around the head and neck in American football than, than in, um, in other. Well, and they're trying to limit that a lot. You know, our good friend to both of us, Pat Johnson, is expert in that, and he's the guy in the tent on the sidelines at the NFL games for looking at concussions and that sort of thing. That's what they're trying to eliminate, at least as much as possible. Yeah. I mean, we've got to live life within the risk uh, factors. Otherwise, you know, we'd have a very dull life. We would sit on on our couch and just... uh, Watch TV. That would be no fun. So, we, yeah. we, you know, we've got to use science to help us define the right approach and, and limit problems if we can. And I think that's that's the whole purpose of, of, the, of the big breakthroughs in imaging. Yeah. And the main thing I want people to be aware of, and, you know, I'm so sorry for the loss to the Saget family. As I say, I didn't know Bob Saget other than to just say hello if we saw each other. And everybody that I know that knows him said he was one of the genuinely nicest guys in the industry. So I really want to say to the family how much I am sorry for their loss. 
I want to say to people in general, you know, take seriously when you get a blow to the head. And, you know, we always were told growing up, you know, get a concussion, don't go to sleep and, you know, keep an eye on the kid if he fell off his bike or whatever. The reason you're saying that that is important is because sometimes there can be a brain bleed that's slow and it can show up hours, sometimes days later, and you need to pay attention and look for changes. If it's a real strong blow to the head, I don't think one can overreact to that. And um, and it's a simple five-minute CT scan if there's any doubt. It's, it's always a daunting thing to go into an emergency room, and nobody likes to do it. But, but with a head injury, um, I'd rather err on the side of... Um, of overreaction than underreaction. Yeah. Now, one of the things I want to turn to that I think is really important because it's a passion of mine, and that has to do with the neuropsychiatric disorders that we deal with. So many people regard these things with a stigma that, you know, if they have depression, if they have anxiety, if they have OCD, if they have these different disorders, there's a stigma associated with that, that there's some kind of weakness or some kind of problem that they should be ashamed of or feel guilty about. And I do everything I can to change that thinking. And one of the things that I want people to understand is these are not necessarily all psychological in nature. Some of them are not even primarily psychological in nature. When we look at things like depression, anxiety, PTSD, some of these things have significant neurological underpinnings, and you have been involved in some real breakthrough findings and treatments with fMRI being able to locate specific locations in the brain, specific nodules in the brain that are identified with anxiety and depression and being able to do something once you locate that. Talk about that some. Yeah, I I think it's amazing uh, work that was done not by me but by, you know, a um, nationally funded NIH consortium of re- neurological researchers in the I think 2016 the work got completed where the brain was mapped much like Vasco da Gama or Magellan or one of those great uh, discoverers from five six hundred years ago when they left Spain and Europe to f- try and discover the world they didn't know where they were heading was the world round where was America where was India this is more or less what we the world we're in now with the brain we launched an expedition, really, with a human connectome project, which cataloged the brain more like a map cartographer mapping all the inlets and outlets of the world's surfaces on the ocean. And this enormous project uh, seemed to be something that was in search of, of its use because we had this tremendous information but no way of really using it until artificial intelligence came along to help us take a subject, say a patient with a given disorder, let's say Alzheimer's, and map that person's brain and then compare it with these thousands of normal brains. Uh, When I say normal brains, there's a spectrum of normal, but we're done on this um, human connectome, and we can now measure the particular subject versus the abnormality and see the anomalous areas in the brain of the subject, and there's a pattern if it's depression or if it's anxiety or if it's Alzheimer's. And more and more, this is the cutting edge of the next decade where we're going to be able to be like the old explorers and find, in fact, that uh, we thought we were in India, but we were really only in the Caribbean as we went around the earth, right? So now we can actually understand all the different abnormal areas of the brain. All right, so what you're saying is you've got a thousand brains here of people that are not experiencing anxiety, for example. And then you have a subject here that is experiencing debilitating anxiety. 
And because you have a pattern of these thousand brains here that are not experiencing anxiety, and you have a subject here, and you look at how their brain profiles, and you compare the two and say, all right, what's the difference? And this anxiety patient has a location in their brain that is lighting up or not lighting up, showing traffic in an area different than those, then you've located an area that is behaving differently in this specific area. And so you then check another patient with anxiety, another patient with anxiety, and you find consistency that patients with anxiety are showing a profile in this one location that leads you to believe that this specific location has to do specifically with anxiety. It's there with anxious patients. It's not there with non-anxious patients. As a general rule, if you took all the anxiety patients with depression slash anxiety, some have more anxiety than depression. You can see the type of anomalies when it's pure depression with only a little bit of anxiety versus the other way around. So we're on the early road to cataloging the diseases now. They did an amazing job cataloging the different functional units in the brain using uh, in the Human Connectome Project using the wiring and the computers of the brain to see the patterns of a normal brain. And you're finding those locations where in the brain? We're targeting the, the executive area of the brain in terms of um, an area that would be amenable to treatment with with things like transcranial magnetic stimulation. Okay, and these are prefrontal if they're executive. Yeah, in, in the right-handed person, it would be the left pre, uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, yes. Okay, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Yes, that's executive area of the brain. Also linked to mood, decision-making, planning, critical part of the brain, but um, anxiety seems to reside in those areas as well. Okay, so this is command central. Command Central, yeah, headquarters. And you have also seen an ability to impact these areas with what? Well, transcranial magnetic stimulation is a safe, non-pharmacological way to target those areas. Obviously, drugs have other side effects. Using TMS, you don't have the problem of um, the pharmacological negative effects because it's biologically... 100% safe. Okay, now let's talk about this transcranial magnetic stimulation because what we're talking about, you don't actually touch the patient. There's nothing invasive here. You're not putting magnets in the brain. You're not putting implants in the brain, which are fine to do if you need to. And there are things. Mm -hmm. There are indications for that, yeah. That are indications yeah. for that. But this is much safer than right. that. And you're talking about Mapping the brain, locating this area with an fMRI, correct? Yeah. So we use a GPS system, uh, a targeting system using advanced MRI and fMRI to locate the specific node and where exactly it is. Because you want to direct the magnetic field, which is an external magnetic field outside of the head. It's, as you mentioned, nothing invasive. But the magnetic field can be targeted to within 2.5 centimeters from the skin surface, and also the epicenter you would like to target the specific area you want to treat. So you put a, a head holder with a device which has on it a GPS system. We have the 3D, you know, the X, Y, and Z coordinates, north, south, east, west, plugged in electronically into the head holder, and you have an image that you can see where the epicenter is, and then you, you you concentrate or you, you angle your head holder so that the sweet spot of the magnetic field is over the area of the brain that you want to switch off or on and to get more into rhythm with the brain's um, natural default mode network. Okay. And so you then start putting magnetic impulses it switches on and off a magnet so um, um it's a electromagnet that switches click 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 you know that noise in an mri scan it's just the same as an mri magnet except within a small device and it changes the magnetic field within the 
tissues. If you remember from high school physics, if you have an, a magnet switching on and off and you have fluid in that field, you'll create a current. So what we're doing is creating a current in the wires that represent the white matter wiring in the brain to switch it on and make it rhythmic rather than firing in a way that's incoherent. How long does the treatment last and how often do you have to do it and for how many days in a row? So there's a huge breakthrough. You know, TMS started in 2010, around 2010, and the treatment required one treatment a day of an hour a day for 30 days. Right. And now, since about two and a half years ago, and now finally FDA approved, is the Theta Burst concentrated um, TMS where it's just three minutes takes three minutes to do what used to take an hour, and you can do five of those treatments in one day so that rather than having treatment for a month, you can get a full course, five treatments a day for five days. Okay, so there's three minutes, mm -hmm. five treatments a day for five days. For five days. So you're talking 15 minutes of treatment a day spread out throughout the day for five for days. five days. And what's the efficacy? 80% of people with this treatment feel much be uh, significantly better um, as opposed to just over 60% before. So there's a huge improvement in, uh, in efficacy. 80% of the people have a marked improvement in depression and anxiety. Yes. And this is without pharmacology. They're not on medication. Right. And... On follow-up, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, what's so the longevity? The durability is very good. This is the work that's going on now. We've been doing this only for two or three years now, but it looks from all early reports that it's as or more durable than the traditional treatment. Yeah, it's the precision that's making the difference that's, here, that's right? That's right. I think it's two parts. It's the delivery of this theta burst, a more concentrated, powerful I think that's the right term, without having biologically negative side effects, as well as the fact that we can see the abnormality better with advanced imaging and fMRI to specifically target the area rather than the general region. Yeah. I'll brag on you guys for a minute about this precision business because you, I don't know how many, seems like dozens of times you've had me in the MRI tube and we've done injections on my knees, on my back, and I've had them done in the past where they kind of like, yeah, hit his low back, yeah, hit, hit kind of the knee area. You guys go in with ultrasound guided. I can see the needle go in. I've videotaped my own treatments, yeah, you've you been, know. you've been, uh, <laughs> we've experimented on you ad nauseum. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. But you, you're, a, you're a fantastic patient because you don't feel pain. We don't even have to give you any, any analgesic. You say, just bring that thing on over. Yeah, right. <laughs> you load me up with lidocaine. But you are, you don't like the small space of the MRI, though. You hate the MRI. I do hate yeah. it. Well, I don't fit in it very well. Yeah, you're much too big. I'm like, yeah. my shoulders big are touching the sides. Yeah. But I've done it. I get you in there get and do there, it. Yeah. And I think I'm done. You go, well, let's take a look at one more thing. Yeah, let's <laughs> not. Well, no, let's do. Then I'm back in there again. Yeah. Yeah, I think translational medicine is 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 bringing, bringing new breakthroughs from the academic world into the clinical space without big bureaucracy is the secret to really expanding great medicine to the, to the people rather than keeping it locked up in, in um, ivory towers with unbelievable difficulty to be able to get it. So I think this is the key to, to uh, the, the next, next period in medicine. Well, there are people suffering with depression and anxiety that is debilitating. You know what I'm talking about. People that just simply... Suicidal, yeah. Absolutely cannot put one foot in front of the other. and. They've tried medications, and so often they say, I was on the medication, but I felt like a zombie. The side effects were so bad for me, it was like, which is worse? And then for some people, 
where DNA tests are done and then they dial in the medication. And I'm not trying to be anti-medication here. But when you're talking about a non-pharmacological, non-invasive, non-side effect, 80% efficacy, long-term durability durability here, why is this not being screamed from the mountaintops? Why is this not a three-inch screamer headline in every newspaper in the country? Why are we having to talk about this? Because I can tell you, I bet you we can stop 100 cars on Sunset Boulevard right now, and 98 of them will not have heard about this, and we'll be in the other two. Yeah. I think the early adopters, you know, it's like technology. The early ne- the early advent of the internet, people didn't know what, was, you know what it was. But at some point, this will take hold, and people, both the doctors who use this technology need to get skilled with it, and there are only a few places that are able to uh, use both the imaging and the TMS and bring the two technologies into one location. Of course, most often, you know, very good guys, psychiatrists, um, trained over the last 20, 30 years, are not imaging um, cognizant. They are becoming more involved in this. But because they control the patient, they might not be that keen to have the imaging team, which may be something they're not that knowledgeable about, come into the into the arena with their patients because it changes the dynamic between them and their patient until they are themselves comfortable with the technology. So my, my job is to try and bring the technology to the psychiatrist to teach them, and they, then they can use it themselves on their own patients. You know, Meanwhile, we make, uh, make our mark by simply providing that in our best way we can to um, as many patients as we can. But really, it needs to be extended throughout the, the, the country. Well, even with some of the prior iterations of this, with some of the guests that we've had on the show, that we have been fortunate enough and you have been generous enough to help with, the results have not been the same for every single patient, and it's better on some disorders than yeah, others, yeah. but the letters that we get, the emails we get from these people after going through some of these TMS treatments, they're like, I can't believe the difference in my life that this has made in people that have tried everything before and then get this because what it does is it wakes up areas of the brain that for some reason have ceased to function in the way that they were intended to function, correct? That's right. And I think selecting the right patient as well is important. So, for instance, OCD is a very difficult disorder to to treat. There's often a comorbid component of depression, and if you help with the depression, it helps people handle their OCD as well. But as you know, Phil, some some of these very, very sad cases of, of OCD where people are, just cannot get out of that repetitive ritualistic behavior, TMS can help with that, but it often doesn't make a huge difference. And so we have to pick our, our, our population that we can help uh, judiciously and um, any type of condition that has a comorbid depression component is amenable to tremendous help from TMS. So whether it's traumatic brain injury with depression, because often people with TBI will have severe depression years after the injury. The neuroplasticity that is stimulated by TMS helps generally with the brain, but really turns the mood around. So that's one big subset. Obviously, Pure depression, patients who are just endogenously depressed, especially severe depression from whether it's suicidal, whether they have suicidal tendencies or whether they're post, one big subset are postpartum depression, 
ladies who get suicidal after having a baby, a very sad time to be depressed. It tremendously turns around depression in young young mothers or mothers in general who are depressed. So that's those are two very important um, components. The other types of depression are with chronic pain. People who have chronic pain syndromes that go to every pain doctor around and they haven't had a great response from all the various pain meds and there's a lot of meds they get. Depression, if you can help them with their depression, it helps them reduce the pain. So the TMS in, the, yeah, in that environment is, is another very important. Yeah, a big part of pain, and I'm talking organic pain. I'm not talking about somebody that's just imagining this or whatever. I'm talking about nerve-based organic pain. There still is a big perception component to that and how they represent that to themselves. And if they get depressed and they haven't been able to alleviate the pain, they start to get into a condition of learned helplessness. And if you can alleviate the depression where they can see a light at the end of the tunnel, they're not so down about everything, then they don't get into so much cognitive lethargy. They start to think more. They start to look for opportunities. They start to use their mind more. Everything goes up. Their likelihood, their prognosis improves if they start helping themselves. So depression is a huge barrier to treatment outcome. You've got to get the patient involved. And the big breakthrough is the neuro-navigated, I call it the GPS, using the GPS right. system, the imaging to target specific areas and to sub-select between depression and anxiety and to because we will treat more the anxiety component where we see on the BEC scores and the B, uh, the anxiety indexes. If it's more anxiety, we'll treat that. It'll help also reduce the depression. So we're in exciting times with the new tools, being able to see the various abnormalities and then using the neuronavigation to target that area rather than the traditional random placement of the um TMS unit. And how do people handle being in the, it's not really a stereotaxic device, right? No. It holds their head some, but it's not as restrictive as being in a stereotaxic device. Yeah, no, the head is not uh, restricted at all, but there's just a, a sort of a disc more or less like this placed on the head. Um, again, we're on radio, so that probably doesn't help too much, but uh, just it's a, it's a square plastic disc that's put on the head and no, not painful at all. Yeah, so they don't get claustrophobic about it. No. There's a certain discomfort in the first treatment, first couple of treatments, like a woodpecker pecking at the skin. And we do say if you've ever had an epileptic seizure, that is the one contraindication potentially. And the other thing is we don't like to treat children younger than 18, 16 sometimes, if they are mature f physiologically. Yeah, and why is that? Um, I think the, the brain is still evolving in teenagers, and um, there's just not enough work done on it um, yet. To I think it probably does no harm at all, but you know, just playing traditionally, I mean, not traditionally, but just following um, cautious parameters we tend to not uh, treat young te or mid-teenagers. What exactly do you think is happening when the magnetic impulses are targeting that specific location in the brain? Uh, that, is a, that is the question that uh, everybody asks. But on a biochemical level, if you think of two nerves as a, an axon with a nerve cell, and then there's a space between one nerve and the next nerve, the synapse, the synaptic space. When you have a magnetic field changing and creating a current, it changes the, the charge in that space. And it's all really biochemistry. I mean, medicine is just a giant chemical reaction with physics thrown in, right? So you, you're, you're modulating 
the transmission of signal from one wire to the next, enhancing it and getting it more organized. Well, I knew exactly what you were going to say. And the reason I ask you that so you could say it is that's what I mean when I tell people there shouldn't be a stigma associated with having some of these neuropsychiatric disorders. This has nothing to do with psychology. And that's what I wanted to point out about endogenous depression. That's a word people probably don't use a lot. There's endogenous depression and exogenous depression. And the only difference is endogenous depression is a depression that occurs without the presence of an identified stress event. People look at their lives and they say, no, I didn't have someone die. I didn't lose my job. There was no big stressor that caused me to be depressed. I just am depressed. Whereas exogenous depression, they can point to something in their life that was depressing. They lost a loved one. They lost their job. They went into financial hardship. They have been marginalized in some way. And it's a reactive, environmentally, they can tie it to some environmental event. These are not diagnostic differences. You won't see them in the DSM, but they're things that we look at to differentiate what type of depression we're looking at. And oftentimes these are neurobiological disorders and people come in with a stigma. It's like having a kidney infection. What the hell is that? Why would you attach a stigma to that? This is nothing you did. It's just something that occurs. And now there's this huge breakthrough to it. And I want to scream this from the rooftops. I want people to know. You know, at Smart Brain and Health, we say that if it weren't that it was a little bit expensive to get these treatments, you know, everybody would get them because it helps even the the well-balanced person who doesn't believe he's depressed. It actually helps neuroplasticity and the executive area of the brain. So at some point, I would imagine we'll develop a brain spa where people will come in for a, for a brain massage with the TMS unit because that's yeah. really um, the fact that it doesn't have any negative effect. If it were more affordable, we'd use it far more. Well, I can tell you there are so many people when I was practicing that never knew they were depressed until they weren't. They just thought, this <laughs> is not, how you live. Yeah. Uh-huh. They just thought the world looks gray. I cry myself to sleep <laughs> every night. I feel like the world is full of gloom and doom. They never knew they were depressed until all of a sudden – It's like somebody turned on color TV and they saw a blue sky and they felt joy. They just never knew that's not how you lived until all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, but across time through process, they didn't feel that way anymore. I think there are so many people that perhaps are depressed or anxious that think that's just life. Well, you know, it's it's like how many people do you know that see the the world either with a cup half full or half empty. Exactly. And if you could take the people who see the world, the cup half empty all the time, you know, they're always down, they're the victim, and you just give them a little TMS, I think you'll see that same person without putting any (laughs) more water in that cup will see the world as half full. Exactly. The cup is half full. So it's, it's that subtle. It's not the person's fault. There's just a, a trigger or biochemical issue that um, just helps the patient into that better space. And for those people that do have challenges, stressors, I mean, we're coming out of the pandemic right now, and anxiety, depression, loneliness, stress are at the highest levels they've been probably ever recorded, according to the CDC and other agencies that have been surveying this type thing. And some of this is because they have lost jobs, they've lost businesses. It's the helplessness, the the feeling of helpless. They've lost homes, they've had problems, marriages are failing and all. And I'm not saying if you go get 
TMS treatment that all of a sudden you're going to get your job back and your financial problems are going to go away, but you're going to be better equipped to cope with, overcome, look for solutions to, and and deal with that. Because when you are depressed, you're not as cognitively efficient as you would have been otherwise. You're not as active. Your energy levels, everything goes down biochemically, physiologically, psychologically, everything goes down when you're depressed. And if you're anxious, again, you're distracted. You're hearing a lot of noise and stuff. You're not nearly as efficient concentration-wise because you have all this going on in your head. Now, you said if it weren't for the fact that these are a bit expensive, nationally around the country, what do these kind of treatments generally cost someone, and does insurance cover them? Well, the good news is insurance is now starting to cover them, and so the Blue Cross and even Medicare are seeing the tremendous results from this. So this is, as we're speaking, they're becoming covered by insurance. Um, when when not covered by insurance, it's about $400 per treatment. So that's, for a course of, of 30 treatments, that's quite quite significant for most people and um, even though the benefit from that they they feel it and uh, you know the productivity getting back to their life makes it worthwhile the medication is very expensive too if you're taking pharmacological meds for this but um, it's it's about 350 to 400 dollars a treatment i believe okay so and you're talking about 25 treatments. Ten, I think it's about seven thousand dollars for seven to eight thousand dollars for a course of treatment. Yeah. Okay. But insurance is going to come through, and um, we always help people as well. You know, um, as you know, we yeah. often do it for. I don't know how you nothing. stay in business. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes they're heartbreaking stories, and you know, there's a tremendous good feeling for our team when we see we help people. So it's. Um, it's not always about the financial component. Are there places around the country that do a good job on this? Yeah, I think they do. And um, they use the traditional treatment. What we're talking about today is something that outside of certain academic and very specialized institutions are not being able to do the targeted um, imaging-based TMS where you're actually able to subselect areas of the frontal executive area and and concentrate on those so the traditional treatment that's been going on for seven or eight years is, is a general treatment to the general area they get about a 58 percent improvement rate and there are um, there are centers all over the country that do it without imaging guidance now we will provide the imaging and send the database to the tms centers and there are plans to educate all those psychiatrists on how to use the imaging-guided system. So the primary impact now is depression and anxiety. Th yes. And, of course, that is comorbid to so many other things. So whether you're dealing with a primary diagnosis of PTSD or whatever. Traumatic brain injury. Or, know, TBI. Or especially things like... Um, brain degenerative disease you know depression is one of the one of the most terrible parts of alzheimer's disease and if you can get people out of that depression you, you know you're stimulating neurological tissue in a patient with a brain that's degenerating you can give them more time before they have their memory slip away and it's got to seem like it rolls the clock back yeah i know just, it doesn't i'm yeah, just saying it just, just keeps the neurological tissue regenerating itself and in stroke and in multiple sclerosis now there are also very big applications for this so it's it's a big big advance generally and i think we're going to see a lot more of this including new techniques now like ultrasound targeted to areas of the brain repetitive ultrasound is something that helps with certain conditions such as essential tremor you can remove this debilitating essential tremor where somebody c can't lift a cup without spilling everything and yet intellectually they're very capable 
and it's not Parkinson's disease. Their intellectual abilities are good, and uh, we can, using the imaging guidance, target the few neurons that are responsible for this te- attention tumor and numb them, and it knocks them out using an ultrasound-focused beam that then returns the patient to normal, smooth function of motor skills. Well, you're apparently a mind reader as well, because my very next question I was going to ask you about was about this essential tremor. I understand by doing this mapping and then using not magnetic, but instead ultrasound and targeting these specific neurons, you're able to switch off this essential tremor with 90% efficacy. I think it's higher than 90%, actually. It's uh, quite remarkable. It's a new machine that is a combination of a a high-energy ultrasound machine within an MR machine so that you're using the imaging because the brain is not forgiving. You have to get the exact neurons that you're aiming at. It's very much Star Wars-like, but um, in the planning takes, you know, takes four or five hours. It's not like TMS where, where, where it's quite quick. This is very, it takes a team, a neurosurgeon, neuroradiologist, and uh, a lot of pre-planning, but it is such a dramatic um, well, solution. It's, it's four or five hours in getting the target, but then the treatment itself is one time. Is Correct. one time, yeah. Sometimes you have to repeat it, but mostly you'll get a dramatic, on one side, you'll do one side at a time. And if you get a tremendous result on the one side, which we usually do, we'll go back on a separate occasion and do the, the other side. And the treatment is how long? About three hours. But he's awake. Um, you know, you're awake, and uh, it's just very meticulous planning. And um, How long is the ultrasound bombardment? Um, that's a matter of 20 minutes. But it's all about placing and, and scanning. You have to scan. You got to, You have to find the specific X, Y, and Z coordinate of that, of that epicenter of the area where the problem is causing the, the essential tremor. Okay, but once you've got it targeted, 20 minutes... It may be four or five hours to yeah. get it targeted. Yeah, I would say an hour. You know, we, we don't rush with this. We, we make one patient for the whole morning, actually. Well, you and I have a case we're going to do together at Stanford, right? Yeah. We're going to do the mapping yeah. here and yeah. then go to Stanford yeah. and do the actual. Yeah, we could do it. Yeah, the, I, I usually do this at Stanford University. Well, I'm really looking forward to that. But now, for people that, haven't looked this up and you can go to Dr. Google or whatever and look up essential tremor. But we're talking about, you know, if you're one of those people that holds your hand out and, you know, you've just got that tremor in your hand and sometimes you'll hear a tremor in the voice, you'll hear it in the vocal cords and all, and it gets worse with age, right? It does. We're talking about 90 plus percent efficacy in switching that off. Again, this is huge. It's huge. So at Smart Brain and Health, we get the patients, we screen them, we see if they're, you know, likely candidates to benefit, and if they are, then we we will ta- we will coordinate getting the care at the top centers in the country. What effect does this have with those that have tremors associated with MS or whatever. Yeah, it's it's FDA approved just for benign essential tremor. There's a lot of work going on for you with using this same device for a number of other conditions, including OCD. There are a couple of areas in the brain where if you target this using the MRI focused ultrasound, that's what the technique is, to certain n- cells in the brain, there's a feeling that you can break this ritualistic cycle that um, OCD people um, unfortunately have. But I think this is a, an area that uh, is also going to provide other great opportunities for this t- type of technology. It also work with Parkinson's, but we're not, um, it's not FDA approved for that yet. That's uh, a more degenerative disease affecting more than just a few cells. So 
But in this one case of essential tremor, there's so many men suffering from this, or people, more, more, more men than women, that, um, that we can't actually get to all of them because there's so much demand for this at the moment. It so revolutionizes there and brings them back to a functioning state. As you know, intellectually, these people are not, at, um, are not affected at all. But it's just this this debilitating social inability to hold anything still, whether it's writing or 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 drinking from a cup. Well, you know, this is just so exciting. I don't know how you even sleep at night. <laughs> really, we've known each other so long, and you're so passionate about this. You must just go to bed at night and just sleep fast, just zzz, <laughs> and then jump up and and get back to it because you are impacting people's lives so greatly. You've been so generous with your time with me over the years and taken me into your Star Wars facilities there. We've studied so many different brain scans and images and stuff, and you've included me in all of it because you know that's my background. And you know, we start out for five minutes, and four hours later, we're still there talking and looking at stuff. And I've just been so grateful that you've included me in the evolution of all of this and the breakthroughs and you've been so kind to come on and help some of our guests that are in such dire straits and stuff some of the people that you've helped as i've said they just you've given them lives back it's just amazing i hope you realize what a difference you've made and how many people you're impacting and educating in the millions that watch and stuff and i know they bombard you afterwards I'm just grateful that um, there are all these brilliant guys out there in the universities who do all the work that uh, enable me to bring it out of the university environment into an easier venue for people to teach them about this stuff. Well, I know all of you listening and watching are as excited about this for either yourselves, your loved ones, or someone you know. And we're going to do everything we can to put as many resources up on our website for fill in the blanks on Dr. Phil on our Facebook. And, you know, at the top of that list, of course, is going to be Dr. Jabor's offices here, Medical Imaging of Southern California. Yeah, and then there's one one in Santa Monica and one in Beverly Hills. Yes, and I've been in both many times. (laughs) I think I have my own parking space (laughs) piloned off in front of the one in Santa Monica and my own parking space at the one in Beverly Hills. He keeps this body running. <laughs> <laughs> Which reminds me that whole body zero rad scan, you know, where we can look into the body and find any tiny little abnormality, especially pancreatic cancer and prostate cancer. That's something that I think at some point, I think you had one, didn't you? No. I'm sure cumulatively I have. I don't think I've ever done it all at one time. <laughs> I don't think there's anyway, anything you haven't shot, that, is there, Nicole? I need to show you that sometime. You'll yeah, find that well, very interesting. I've seen the information on it inside, which is a total body. Whole body MR, non-invasive, no radiation, yeah. amazingly accurate detection of the five big diseases, Alzheimer's, pancreatic cancer, Obviously, we see all other sorts of abnormalities because you're seeing every part of the body. But we get to catch things early while you still can do something about it. I always say, imagine if one image can save your life. And that's what the Zero Rad Whole Body Scan is all about. So most people who get to be 45, 50 should think about doing this sort of thing every five years. Yeah. Three to five years. And I don't want to gloss over this. You're saying Zero Rad... Whole body MRI. Whole body MRI. We call it zero rad because they used to do whole body studies, but you used to do it with CAT scans. And I was always reluctant to do it with CT scans because that's radiation. So we developed this um, non-radiation using Siemens technology. Siemens is a big engineering medical company, and they make a fantastic MRI scanner that allowed us to use some proprietary techniques we've developed to to look at the whole body and um, in one and a tw- one hour twenty minutes get um, an amazing look at and into the body 
because when you think about it, what Hippocrates, the, the Greek scholar, uh, was the father of medicine. Since that time, most doctors have relied on taking a good history, palpating, and using the stethoscope, you know, auscultating, and, you know, percussing. And they've been doing this for two, three thousand years. We now have a tool to look in at a, a molecular, le you know, at a very small level at every tissue in the body. Why don't we add that, given that we're in the 21st century? We should be using that quite um, routinely for people at the right time in their lives. Yeah, the images you guys create are astounding. Like I say, I've been spent a lot of time over there, and I walk in there and expect to see Captain Kirk turn around and look at me anytime because you've got this. <laughs> the imaging is amazing, isn't it? It really is because you see the person's face, and then the skin dissolves, and then you see the musculature, then you see the bones, then you just look through the body. It's astounding it what you now do. And now with the you know, artificial intelligence added to it, the machine can find the disease. Right. You, uh, you know, I'm hoping I still have a job in five years because the machine's going to tell me whether it'll just spit out the answer. Oh, I expect you'll find something to do. <laughs> so it's medical imaging of Southern California. There's one in Santa Monica and one in Beverly Hills, just adjacent to Cedar sinai Hospital. I'll have links to all of that on the website. And it's Dr. Bradley Jabor. That's J A B as in boy O U R, Dr. Bradley Jabor. And he has an amazing team over there. His wife, Nicole, is the one that keeps everything running. She organizes <laughs> everything, plans everything, executes everything. And then Brain Boy here does just, the. I just show up. He pushes yeah. the buttons, but Nicole is yeah. here. Nicole, thank you for coming today. Yeah. And getting him here. It's so funny, you know, you call me, but you don't seem to find me, but you call Nicole and she gets it all going. Of course. Huh? <laughs> She's so buttoned up, it's not even funny. These two are both from South Africa, and they met in an airport, by the way, running to meet different airplanes, and Brad sees her and says, oh, hi, hey. Oh my goodness. Uh, <laughs> Can I have your phone number? And she says, hell no. Well, let me give you mine. <laughs> so he did. And it took a while, but they did connect up because they actually had some connections through family grandmothers connections. and yeah, families. A and small world. Yeah. Everything. And I was honored to be at their wedding. How long has it been now? Eight years. It's, has it it's been flown, eight years? It's flown by, wow. hasn't it? Congratulations to you. <laughs> she Nicole. put up with me for this yeah. time. Not easy. You all do an amazing job at your clinics. And I'm, again, very grateful for all the time Thanks you for, give us. Oh, and thank you for today. And thank you. For, it's always uh, such fun talking to you. I learn a lot in how to communicate. We're just watching you and, and listening to you. Well, we get it done, don't we? You do. Well, thank you so much for Thanks. this time. I've taken more of your time than I said I would, but I'm so fascinated by this. It's my natural curiosity about all of this, and I hope everybody really listened to this. These are breakthroughs that are game changers. These are game changers in neuropsychiatric disorders, and I hope people really hear this and act on it. Don't continue to suffer with what we're doing. And we started out talking about head trauma and brain bleeds to the Saget family again. We are so sorry for your loss. I hope everybody will follow up and look at the links that we put. When we were talking about things, those images you can check later if you were driving or walking or doing something where you weren't watching, you were listening instead. We'll have those on the website. Laferne, you'll put those up for everyone. We will see you again and be watching for Brad on Dr. Phil because I corner him every time I get an opportunity. So yeah. thanks for being here. We'll see you next time. Brad, thank you so much. Thanks, Phil. All right, bye.